Let's do it. Five seconds to go in the first half. Dante fires deep to the left. Moss caught it at the 11, but now he oh, look at it. this! To Mo oh, Williams! Touchdown! You gotta be kidding me! Welcome back to another episode of the Climbing the Pocket podcast. I am your host, Jason Brown. You can find me on Twitter at Brown Jason. Not joined by the whole crew right now. Will be joined by the whole crew eventually, plus a special guest. But right now, I got QB1 and QB2 here to get things started with all y'all. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to the man. JR, what's going on with you, my man? How you doing? How you been since the last time we talked? I'm good, man. A bit snowed in right now. You know, we got our first snow here of the past few months, and I've been telling everybody, especially all my Minnesota friends, we're not used to we're not used to snow down here. So, I'm happy to tell everybody that we got six inches. <laughs> hey, man, I, I I get it. I understand. You know, uh, growing up in 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 Ottawa and then moving to Atlanta, and anytime we got any snow, it they shut the whole place down. But it was for good reason because people just didn't know what to do with themselves. All the food was bought up out of all the stores. Did you get your bread and milk, JR? Oh, yeah. I went grocery shopping last week, so I was good. <laughs> but you staying safe? I guess, did you do anything fun to, to bring in the new year? I know you let us know you were heading into church. Was, was that pretty much what you did? You kept it uh, kept it spiritual, or did you pop in any of that Martinelli's like Prince? <laughs> no, nah, I just kept it spiritual, went to church, had game night with the family, you know, played a little taboo, a little jingle, a little uno, so I was good. Man, you 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 might be Teddy Bridgewater for real. As nah. more time goes on, the more are you in the choir, Jr. No, I'm not. Okay, all right. So we found we found some divergence there. We found a little divergence. Well, Prince. Yeah, man. How how was that sugar hangover the next day from that uh, that sparkling cider that you cracked into there on New Year's Eve? Y'all, so here, here's the thing. Um, it's crazy. If you get me some, you know, some sparkling cider and whatnot. I'm out the rest of the night. Like it, it's going to be a hangover the next day. I'm be jumping off the walls, and man, I, I I get tipsy when it comes to some of that sugar. The extra. That's why my parents really never try to buy me like Starburst or Skittles growing up because they knew the minute I got some sugar inside me, I wasn't going to sit down for the rest of the night. And as you guys can tell on our podcast, I don't ever sit down even when I don't have sugar in my body. So. It's true. You uh, you you do stay moving around. I had a bit of a flashback when you when you sent us that picture to Martinelli's though, because that was like the staple in, yeah. in my home. You know, like your know, parents, yeah. you know, they didn't drink, but you know well, they they didn't want to miss out. So you know, we they had to go get the fake bubbly. So uh, yeah, and that's the funny thing is, is that that was a tradition for us growing up because, um, you know, every like we're growing up every every New Year's Eve, obviously, my dad would just go to the store. He would go buy like you know two or three bottles of that. And then, you know, we'd watch the kind of like New York celebration and whatnot. But that, and then uh, right as, you know, it got probably like five minutes in, we would all open it. We'd open up, pour the drinks and stuff. And then we'd make sure we, we would count down, watch the, the ball drop. And then we take a swig of all that. But last recent years, you know, we were always been at church. So, you know, I haven't been able to do that. But this year, you know, I didn't go and, you know, my uh, family was all kind of scattered a little bit. So, but I still was able to keep up with that in a tradition and, uh, you know, pop some bottles and yeah. All right. Nice. Yeah, pop some bottles. Well, I guess, you know, we got a couple of things we want to get to here. Nothing too in-depth, you know, bye week here. So there's not a lot of you know, stuff we really need to get too deep into with, with the team just yet. But there's a couple of stories, a couple of things that popped up over the course of the week that I wanted to get y'all's takes on here. And uh, something that actually came up yesterday. So when I was recording the uh, the Pocket Protectors podcast with uh, with Luke and Eric, Luke kind of mentioned that, you know, playoffs are really like his Christmas, that every year he really just kind of unplugs from everything. And the weekends are for him and some beers and football and so I was just curious, I guess, do you guys have any playoff traditions or anything that you do uh, that's different when the playoffs roll around? And I'll start with you, JR. Nah, you know, I like in, I lock in. I like to watch the games by myself, though. I'm like that with the Vikings as well. Don't like to have anybody else around me. That's just how I focus on the game. I'm not a guy that likes to go to bars or big gatherings to watch the game. Um, the only time I really do that is with the Super Bowl. Um, but other than that, I really like to lock in and just watch the games by myself, have something to drink, maybe some wings or some pizza, and just focus on the game. 
Yeah, and and, and that uh, I mean, that, that sets me up for a, a perfect follow up question because you said you know the Super Bowl, you know, you, that's that's kind of a tradition that many folks have is that you get your your party on for the Super Bowl. Let's say the Vikings do make it to the Super Bowl. How's that going to go? You still, you know, hitting the Super Bowl parties or are you going to be locked, you know, in the base by yourself watching the game? Yeah, I'll definitely be locked in the basement by myself focusing on the game. <laughs> yes, sounds about right. And I'll be right there with you. How about you, Prince? Any uh, playoff traditions? And I guess, you know, the Vikings do make it all the way. What are you going to be doing? You going to be out with people to, to share in the nerves together or are you going to be locked away, you know, watching the game by yourself? Yeah, I don't. I don't actually have any playoff traditions. I have like I've always had regular season game traditions. So every time, you know, I'll try to get up uh, three or four hours before games start. Um, I uh, this year I kind of started doing the whole you know Photoshop and stuff. But I make sure I take a shower. Um, I'll get my Vikings gear on, you know, fully clothed or whatnot. And you know, I just kind of like you guys, just kind of make sure I'm away from anyone that I feel is going to be distraction for me to not be locked into what's happening in the game. Super Bowl a little bit different, playoffs a little bit different. I'm I'm well more okay. Uh, I'm more okay with uh, being around, you know, people who who just enjoy watching football, all that stuff. And you know, past couple of years it hasn't really been um, a lot for us to to watch. So I mean, this year I'll obviously be a little bit more locked in. But Super Bowl time. I'll hit up a party. I mean, uh, whether the Vikings are then or not, I think it's just it's just a fun time to be around people. I can't afford it. So, you know, it'll be a good time for a party. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. And, well, you know, Yenka, there's been many times either on this podcast or kind of in our group chat where, you know, you've lamented the fact that, you know, Arif is kind of hard on you. He's kind of rough on you. Well, like retweet people giving you grief on Twitter.com. But I've come to realize that you might have no better friend in all of this world than Arif Hassan, because you came out with an article that got people kind of upset. And people got a little upset. Uh, people, people got you said, I mean, they were pretty upset. They were pretty upset. They were pretty upset. But then your man, you know, Arif, he saw you taking the slings and arrows on Twitter and he came in and rescued you with his own piece about Case Keenum and the passing offense that took well almost all the attention away from you and has had Arif's uh, mentions on fire here for the, uh, well, the well, pretty much since the article came out. And so I jokingly put this, this, this question down is why does Arif hate Case, which obviously isn't true. But um, I guess I wanted to, to get y'all's takes on, you know, just high level real quick. Don't have to get too deep into it because it's a subject we've talked about before. But I guess what were your thoughts on kind of that deep dive that Arif did into the Case Keenum and his play? And then, you know, the way he broke it down with the stats and also the game film. And how does that align with what you're seeing? And does that give you any cause for concern or anything like that? And JR, I'll start with you. And then Yinka, you can bring us home on this one. Um, I thought the... The wording and the heading was a bit extreme. Um, I didn't think liability was a good word, or I thought he could have used a better word in the heading. But a lot of the points that he made within the article, I thought were very fair of his play to this point. And just piggybacking off of what we saw in the Chicago game and what I've said previously on previous episodes, the passing attack just hasn't been there or as consistent as we have liked to have seen these past few weeks, really since the Thanksgiving Day game. That's the last time we've seen a consistent passing attack through all four quarters. But I thought he did make some really valid points in his article, as he always does. It's very thorough and very well written. Um, Just going back to the Chicago game last week, I thought the game plan was very vanilla. Uh, You could tell that Pat Shermer didn't really put an advanced or detailed game plan together. And I think a lot of the thoughts that are out there, a lot of theories that are out there as far as the Vikings not wanting to show their hand to playoff teams or some of the kinks and twists that they have made in their passing game through the latter half of the season and keeping it very vanilla. I think that is a very fair argument. What you saw was a lot of receivers not really getting open down the field because they're not really running a lot of advanced concepts like they were earlier in the season. And, you know, a lot of very, very vanilla concepts that they were running earlier in the season when Case wasn't really comfortable with the game plan as far as 
running the same concepts over and over and maybe keeping a small package of plays was keeping Keenum most comfortable. That's what you have seen last week, especially against the Bears. So I thought Arif really made some really good points, and Yinka can probably touch on a little bit more of what he actually went over in the article. Yeah, and Yinka, I guess bring us home on this one here. And I guess um, just to follow up on that, just uh, I guess a little bit more flavor on the question for you here is, I guess, with us, you know, the, the point that JR brought up there with maybe the team is keeping this a bit vanilla, you know, going into the playoffs, I guess, does that give you any co- uh, cause for concern, just given that it will have been a while since, you know, the team has run the full passing attack, if that's what we're saying it is, in a competitive situation? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I've, I've, I've said it uh, both offline with you guys and just in, in general, like, the, the way that the offense has regressed, I mean, I know that it, it it almost feels like an excuse when we're just like, oh, well, you know, we're just running a vanilla offense so that we can explode during the playoff. But I think you've seen enough teams. You've seen the Patriots. You've seen um, uh, the, uh, the Seahawks in, in previous years that really just kind of step on the throttle going into the postseason. Um, and I much prefer the team to kind of step on the throttle um, rather than pull back in and say, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're saving all our best stuff for the playoffs. Well, you can you can easily get bounced out of the playoffs if you haven't, you know, if you haven't practiced and showed it in the game it film or in the game that it, that it works. Um, if you've noticed some of the, you know, trick plays that we've kind of tried to do has really um, hasn't really worked out that much. And, I, and if we have some of those extra plays that are we're still going to try to run in the playoffs and they don't work. You know, we need. I think we do need to get back to um, get back to the things that we were doing well, and it has concerned me more so than it has been. Oh well, I think that we're going to, you know, definitely get back to what it is. So I don't know. It just to me, it feels a little bit like an like an excuse, but I'm I'm hoping that I'm wrong in that in that essence. Um, as far as like the uh, Arif Hassan piece, so I mean, I have to always clarify with people like my Case Keenan piece wasn't a hit. It wasn't a hit piece. It wasn't a, I think Case Keenum is bad. I didn't even think, like, I didn't even say he was a liability. My, my piece essentially centered around thinking, you know, maybe I was wrong to think that this this guy was just a, you know, just a backup quarterback or career backup. And maybe it's more of a, oh, he's an average quarterback if you get him around, you know, the best possible pieces um, for, you know, for the case. And that, you know, and for some quarterbacks, you can't say that all the time. Even if you get them some really, really nice pieces, good wide receivers on the edges, um, a decent offensive line, they still, you know, won't perform very well. I mean, I think Blake Bortles is a, is a good example of a guy who had really good weapons and didn't perform uh, the way that he should have. But um, as far as a Reese piece, I, <laughs> funny, uh, JR talked about the, the title. It seems that uh, both of us are terrible at picking out titles because that's what seems to get people all upset. But I, I think that I, I actually agree with it. I, th- I do think, you know, Sands, Kai Forbath kicking and stuff. I think Case Keenum is easily uh, the biggest liability that the Vikings have going forward. But I mean, it, it when you kind of extrapolate that point, I mean, a lot of times if you look at who was winning in the playoffs, it's because of quarterback situations. So it's it's really not that far off to say, oh, well, a team starting quarterback is the biggest liability because, yes, wins and losses a lot of times in the playoffs are heavily tied to good and bad quarterback play. Um, and We're going to mark this down. Mark it down, people. This is the day that Yinka finally, on a recorded medium, admitted the overall importance of the quarterback and how much of a factor it's, they are in the wins and the losses. It, it's in in the playoffs, it is important, but it's not the only important thing. I'm well, clarifying of course myself. Not. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and I, that's what that's where you know obviously a good success rate as far as running the football. You know, good. Uh, we have a great number one defense. Them playing at a very very high level, and yes, your quarterback not playing like trash is important. Is essentially what I'm trying to get at. Um, yeah, and and, so and I, I think that's I think that's the part that I think that the folks need to understand a little bit too is that in pointing out some places that you know potentially could be causes for concern or places where 
you know, maybe Case has regressed a bit. It's also not saying that he's playing like complete trash. Like the Vikings yeah. office has still been, you know, top 10. And, you know, from what we've seen, you know, tweeted out by, you know, ESPN and other places, number one defense coupled with a top 10 offense. They, they teams but we fin- get to the Super Bowl. So, but we, we finished top 10. Have we played like a top 10? Even uh, looking at so, the couple of weeks. I think, so I Luke, think Brown, we have- Luke Brown put out an article yeah. uh, at Purple PTSD. So, we talked about this yesterday on, on the Pocket Protectors podcast that even with some of the regression that we're seeing in Case Keenum and the fact that the, the offense isn't as crisp as it was early in the season when, you know, it was. You know, arguably like number one, number two type success rate offense. Case Keenum hasn't regressed to the point where he is playing like a below top 10 quarterback. Like he's still, when you look across metrics, he's still in that top 10 range. So yes, there's some things that are concerning and there's some things that you don't aren't going to see in stats like interceptable passes that were dropped and things like that. But overall, when you're looking at the result, I, I, it's not as bad, I think, as, as sometimes it gets made out to be when you're looking at what you're seeing there in terms of where he is isn't as good as where it was early in the season, but it's still a lot better than a lot of teams. It is still better than a couple of the teams that we're going to be seeing potentially in the playoffs. So it's a concern, but with the defense, less so. Um, and this is also a topic we've we've beaten to death here. So I don't want to go go too far down the rabbit hole. But you know, with this being something that had people really fired up, I definitely wanted to 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 have a quick bit of discussion on it here. So a couple rapid fire points that we need to get to before we get our guest on tonight. Uh, number one, Jr. You posed a really interesting question, which is if if it was possible, because everyone we do know the trade deadline has passed, and this is actually not something that could happen. It is a hypothetical. It's a thought exercise, but it's just something fun. By week, we got nothing else to talk about. So, uh, if we could trade Sam Bradford to the Eagles and recoup a first round pick, would you do it? So, Jr. You tweeted that out. What were the reactions like to that tweet? And I guess, what is your perspective on that? What would you do in that the re- situation? The reactions really were fun. It really was a fun thought that just randomly popped in my head. And I just wanted to see the various viewpoints of, you know, the Twitter timeline simply because, you know, we all have mixed opinions on a lot of the stuff that surrounds the Vikings quarterback situation. But I thought it was a very interesting question. My personal opinion, I would not do it because I am not for helping the team that we're trying to beat, which is the number one seed in the Philadelphia Eagles. I don't think we need to make one of their biggest weaknesses right now a strong point, which is at quarterback. Everyone knows Nick Foles is not very good. He's not playing good right now. Their backup is Nate Sudfield, who was very bad in their Week 17 game against the Cowboys. Um, they're really struggling at the quarterback position right now. Um, and let's say they were in, do end up trading Sam Bradford to the Eagles right now. I just think that he would have a really a really good advantage on the Vikings from a scheme standpoint. He knows what their strengths and their weaknesses are right now. He knows what Mike Zimmer likes to run from a defensive standpoint, and he knows the strengths and weaknesses of the personnel. So he not only could help their offense, but he could help their defense as well because he knows the weaknesses of what's going on on a day-to-day basis with the Vikings personnel. So if they were to offer me that first round pick, I would not do it. Okay. All right. So JR, as per usual, you are the more level headed, more conservative one uh of our group. And uh also I think lots of times on Vikings Twitter. Yanka, what's your thought? How do you roll on this one? Uh what is your thoughts on on potentially trading Sam Bradford but recouping that, you know, that first round pick? Uh, I'm absolutely I'm absolutely taking the first round pick uh, from the Eagles because I think even with Sam Bradford, I think the the Vikings defense would have still not that big of a problem uh, stopping that offense. Um, and part of my thinking is I'm also looking long term. Really don't know what the Vikings have as far as you know the quarterback situation. This might be this might need to be a year where we you know take a quarterback really really high. Um, just because of the instability there. We don't know if Teddy Bridgewater is coming back. We don't know if Casey Keenum is going to sign with another team. Could be with the Vikings, could be with somewhere else. So having uh, having that first round pick allows you to, um, you know, maybe start considering some of these top end quarterbacks. Um, so, yeah, I'm definitely taking it because I think it helps more solidify your future as well as, you know, if I know if you lose in the playoffs, you lose in the playoffs. Um, I think. I think this season has been very, very successful, way more successful than any of us could imagine. Uh, we haven't 
you know, past that Carolina game, we didn't lose a game since, you know, what was it beginning of October? And I think this has been a significantly more successful season than we thought it was. Am I happy with just that? No. Um, but I am, I'm all, I am also not only looking at this year, but looking at the future. And I do think there's still some, in, some question marks at the quarterback position. So I would need that pick just to, um, you know, make it, make a choice as far as that. Well, I'm gonna need you to stop looking to the future because we got these playoffs coming up and we living in the here and now. Okay. Saxy Prince. But last question, even more serious than the last one. Rapid reaction, starting with JR. If you had the choice of a coach to coach your NFL team in the 2018 season, who are you choosing? John Gruden or Marvin Lewis? I'm going John Gruden because I think he can bring in coordinators to how he wants his offense or defense to be molded. Everyone is just assuming that John Gruden is still going to come in and run, run what he ran in the early 2000s, the Tampa 2 defense and, you know, heavy personnel sets on offense. And I just don't think that's the case. Um, I think he's hired Greg Olson, I think it is, as his offensive coordinator. A lot of people were thinking that he was going to hire Jets offensive coordinator, John Morton, as his offensive coordinator. But he did end up hiring Greg Olson. Uh, I don't know who he's hired as his defensive coordinator yet. Everyone know. He's going to get that job. Speaking of John Gruden, I know it hasn't officially been agreed to terms, but everyone knows that he is getting that job. So I'm interested to see what Gruden does um, on the counter side of that. Marvin Lewis, I just don't I just think he's outdated at this point, And I just think he's just a seat filler at this point. I don't see how. What about he, Marvin outside of Cincinnati where he's not hamstrung by Mike Brown? I just I'm not a big fan of Marvin Lewis. Nothing okay. about me has even striked as, <laughs> you know, being excited about Marvin Lewis. But John Gruden does intrigue me a little bit. I don't think he's going to be that guy from the early 2000s. I think he is a little bit overhyped right now. I don't think he's going to come in and be a world beater or a culture changer right away for the Raiders. But I think he can get them a little better than what we've seen in years past. OK, fair. And Yanker. How about yourself? John Gruden or Marvin Lewis? Who are you picking? Uh, this is a tough one for me just because, like, I mean, I was young when John Gruden was a, was a head coach. And, I, I, yeah, obviously everything that I heard about, I'm like, yeah, John Gruden, you know, he's this guy. He's this fiery guy, talks really fast. Um, he's a good head coach. You, can, you know, you know goes, in, goes ahead and wins. But then, obviously, I started looking at it, and it's just like, well, is – is John Gruden really the guy that we all thought that he was? I mean, Tony Dungy left and, you know, he really, he really inherited a pretty decent squad and continued to win with that squad. Uh, But the thing with, you know, kind of that recency bias with Marvin Lewis is he's, I don't know, you've, you've kind of seen the, the Bengals kind of implode over the last couple of years. You know, they went from being, uh, you know, 10 and six, 10 and six, 10 and six type team that was consistently making the playoffs, but getting bounced in the first, first round. So I, I guess Gruden's name carries still a little bit of weight. So he might be able to bring him uh, a coordinator or two who he really can uh, focus on whatever side of the ball that he really wants to. So reluctantly I'll pick Gruden. I figured that's where we ended up, but I I wanted to pose it like that just because I I know both of y'all feel like John Gruden's a bit overrated. I just wanted to see how overrated you think he is. Uh, So, yeah, your answers make sense. And uh, perfect timing. Wow, that was quick. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, joining us here on the uh, the Climbing the Pocket podcast, we do have Courtney Cronin of, uh, of ESPN. And Courtney, I guess to get things started here, we will do a very easy ice-breaking type question. I guess if you could just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and, and where they can find your work. Sure. I um, am new to Minnesota. moved here roughly four and a half months ago. So still getting used to all of this cold and ice and snow but i mean i guess i should sort of already be used to it because i'm from the midwest a chicago native born and raised um i my last i was my last stop was out in the bay area covering the raiders warriors and 49ers so went from a situation in oakland where they were you know wild card team last year after you know not expecting to make the playoffs particularly and then i'm in minnesota where 
you know, all hell breaks loose and now they're, you know, Super Bowl contender. So essentially you're welcome Vikings fans. Cause clearly everywhere I've gone, um, I've been the reason the teams have done so well, but that's, and that's obviously a joke. Um, we appreciate so, you. So hopefully people can take that as a joke, but yeah, you can find my work at ESPN.com. If you go to the website and then click on the Minnesota Vikings tab, that's where everything shows up and you can follow me on Twitter at Courtney R. Cronin. If you are really the reason that the uh, the Warriors keep winning, then or, or or we're winning, then Jr. is our resident LeBron stan is already very upset with you. Oh man, they were winning before I got there. They won the title <laughs> in uh, 20, 2015. I meant the Raiders. Uh, if I didn't say that, I'm not sure. I can't remember if I said that or not. Um, they were expected to go, you know, eight and eight. Uh, had it made the playoffs in what was it, 13, 13 14 years, and then you know, surprisingly. Um, you know, finished the season really strong. Uh, obviously, lose Derek Carr and then lost in the AFC Wild Card round, which was a year ago this weekend. Yeah, we're just giving you credit for all the winning that was going out there. That's fine. I'll take that. That's that's totally fair. Yeah. So all of it. So I guess we have you on, and you know, we've been stalking you a little bit online, and you know, did find out that you are from Chicago, and so we decided we'd wait on kind of doing the the recap on the Bears game. Until we had you online here, and I guess, what were your thoughts from your perspective? And then I guess before we get to that, did you grow up a Bears fan? You know, I grew up during a really strange time. There was no marquee season for the Bears and marquee era during during my quote-unquote Bears fandom. You know, growing up, I mean, I was in high school when they played in the Super Bowl against the Colts. And yeah, that was a fun time. And you know, I love watching Devin Hester. Uh, love watching Julius Peppers, but I mean, you know, for me, it was kind of like, eh, you know, I, I just wasn't really much of a Bears fan growing up, but my family was more involved in college football. So that for me was, um, you know, kind of where I cut my teeth with football and got to learn about the game. Uh, really kind of grew up a Northwestern Wildcats fan. Um, and then I went off to Indiana to college. So that stopped. Okay. All right. Not a Bears fan. So that that's a, a positive start for us, I guess. What were your thoughts about about the game that the Vikings just played against you? I guess your hometown team that wasn't really your team. Yeah, it was. I mean, I think that Trubisky did all that he possibly could um, under those circumstances of having, you know, down to what two starting offensive linemen um, been down, the, you know, all the receiver depth since like day one of the season. So that's been uh, that was tough. Uh I think that this is why we're hearing so much about, you know, the future of what the future holds for Chicago um, in terms of Pat Shermer or in terms of another offensive minded guy, Josh McDaniels, somebody who can be a quarterback whisperer. It's actually something I'm writing for tomorrow um, just on, you know, where why it would be a good fit to see Shermer there and, and for his future and for Trubisky's future, because, they were overmatched from the beginning against that Vikings defense. If you're already down starting guys you're, and you have a rookie quarterback back there, there's no hope. And, you know, you saw it there on the, on the tremendous, I think, kind of a, a really nice way for the Vikings defense to cap off the season in, in a statement performance that goal line stand, you know, I think it was six plays uh, within the five yard line there to close out the game that they held uh, the bears. And, you know, that last ditched effort, uh, I think Trubisky to Howard trying to throw that ball, uh, you know, just, just kind of shows how overmatched he was, but I do see the potential there for the future and how good he can be. And that, that is their franchise guy going forward, at least as far as we know right now. Um, there are a few. There, are, there are several pieces away. Not a few. A uh, few on offense. Uh, about you know four or five more on defense. Um, but it, it should be. You know, I do think that the Bears are going to be in the. Depending if they can knock this higher out of the park, they're going to be finally contending in the NFC North. Maybe two, three years from now. Yeah, that's fair. And and you touched on uh, on Shermer there. And and one of the things that. I guess I, I was going to say this week, but it's really been a constant all season. And I, I know you do. And I listened to you on the Purple Podcast with uh, with Matthew Collar. Um, that you know, Vikings fans can be very, very touchy when you know anyone puts down analysis of any player, but especially Case Keenum, um, that is can be perceived as negative. And so this past week, Arif Hasan wrote a piece that got people very fired up, talking about the the passing game for the Vikings. And I guess. We're curious from your perspective, because you're around the team. I guess, 
have you heard anything or, or, or what are the players saying about kind of how the, the passing offense has slowed down over the last little bit? Or is that even something that, uh, that, that is a concern internally? You know, I'm not really sure if it's as a concern right now. Um, I mean, it's certainly to the, on the internal part, it's, I mean, I'm, they're not saying it all that much, but when you take a look, the offense has looked pretty conservative um, you know, ever since the Green Bay game and, and the way that they capped off the season. I mean, certainly taking into effect the, the offensive line injuries and you know, not being able to establish a ground game in Green Bay. Um, they were able to do that against the Bears pretty early. But you're, you're, I don't know if you're, seeing, if you're seeing this whole, you know, tr- uh, plateau that people were expecting from Case Keenum. Um, he hasn't had any bad, like, you know, super bad throws. I mean, I can count one in Green Bay um, that, you know, probably makes your stomach turn a little bit. I'm trying to remember what quarter that was in. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, I think that the offense hasn't looked as explosive, uh, you know, in recent games as it has maybe, I don't know, pull, pull week 10 out of there, you know, when he, when he hits five different players for touchdowns in Washington, you know, it's a different, it's a different look offense right now, but, you know, I think you take a look at the cumulative nature of this season where the Vikings ranked 11th in the NFL with 356.9 yards per game. Um, you know, in the way Keenum, you know, he's kind of become this accidental in some regards MVP candidate, uh, you know, 22 touchdowns to seven interceptions. You know, that's a pretty for, for a guy that we didn't expect to be in this position. It's a pretty good ratio to be in. Um, and he spread the ball out quite effectively. I just think that, you know, the last few games of the season, they've been hobbled more. I mean, you take a look, Rudolph admitted he hasn't been a good football player playing through this ankle injury. He hasn't been as effective. It's one of, you know, the top red zone scoring threats in the passing game. Haven't seen, you know, too much, too much there, but you know, an underrated storyline is how, how well Stefan Diggs has played the season. I think that a lot of people think that just because his production hasn't been as in bulk as it was in previous years, um, you know, he still had an excellent season this year, and same with Adam Thielen. Yeah, Courtney, this is Yinka. Uh, you had an excellent point as far as um, how the offense has been a lot less um, explosive, and it's something that I've definitely noticed is um, Keenum hasn't been running as much, you know, picking up first downs, you know, making plays with his feet, uh, but, you know, conversely, the defense uh, has, I think, taken an even further step forward. So with that, you know, lack of explosive offense, but, you know, still a great defense, what would you what would you say your preferred path to the Super Bowl for the Vikings? Uh, what would be your preferred path for the Vikings to get to the Super Bowl? Well, you know, I think that you go back to the way that this season was expected to be laid out, um, and it was always that the defense was going to carry this offense. And it's, you know, a pretty nice security blanket to have when you have this Vikings, you know, number one, you know, they finished number one uh, defense in, in the NFL in scoring in, in you know, points per in Yeah, it's scoring defense and then total defense for the first time since 1970. Um, that's no fluke. I think that that was expected, uh, just given the, the dominance at every level of this defense from the line all the way, you know, in the back in the secondary, um, that they would be the unit that, you know, carries, carries this team regardless. They haven't been forced all that much this season to carry the slack or pick up the slack for the Vikings offense. I mean, in certain, certain circumstances, they've certainly, um, you know, led the charge early, um, you know, when the Vikings offense hasn't gotten off to an early start, but we're able to, you know, win games. Obviously you think of that with uh, the Atlanta game, um, uh, you know, you know, one to 10 on third down and things like that. So for me, it's, you know, I take a look at that defense and realize the strength of that unit um, as a whole is the best defense in, in the NFL right now. And, you know, the best defense that any of these teams, any of the three teams that the Vikings could face in the divisional round um, will have come into contact with this year. And, you know, I think that that, if you're a Vikings fan, that gives you confidence knowing that, Hey, if the offense isn't as explosive, if, you know, if the screen game isn't there, which it hasn't been in the last few weeks. And as we said, due to injury, which hopefully goes away, um, you know, coming, coming back into play next weekend after some rest for these guys that the defense will be able to pick up and, you know, fill any holes as needed. 
And just another question, Courtney J. I here. Thank you once again for coming on. Um, we know the Vikings have beaten a lot of teams in the NFC playoffs right now, the Rams, the Saints, and they struggle with the Panthers. But who's that one team you think really scares the Vikings in this playoff chase? Well, I've always said it's been the Saints, and it's just because I don't bet against Drew Brees in the playoffs. I mean, we've seen it happen too many times. These comebacks, these you know heroics that this – I mean, the reason the guy's been an MVP before and the reason the guy's won Super Bowls. I mean um, – I think that they're a huge threat, and I think it's because they they do a lot dynamically on offense with their running game, um, you know, with Alvin Kamara and, you know, the fact that those guys can catch passes out of the backfield. It kind of spreads the, you know, it spreads the field, and they are, you know, they were stopped early on um, by the Vikings defense. They did a good job in week one containing them. Um, but I think this is going to be a different Saints team second time around because the Saints defense is so dynamic, dr- drastically different from where they were um, in week one. So that, that to me says, okay, that's the team you don't want to face. It seems kind of likely that, you know, on Saturday night we'll find out that they will be facing the Rams just because of that matchup um, against, you know, the Falcons. I, I also think this is going to be a very different scene, a uh, very different foul, uh, excuse me, Rams team than you saw the first time that they played in week 11, were held to seven points. You're going to see a lot more from Todd Gurley. Uh, he's not going to have a quiet day. I would anticipate he's not going to be in the end zone once, but maybe even twice or three times. Um, you know, he's, I think this is going to be a much more explosive Rams team that comes in the U.S. Bank Stadium next week um, as my prediction for the divisional round. And it looks like our man Miles did uh, did 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 make it in here. I guess Miles, did you have any questions for Courtney? Yeah, Courtney. Uh, sorry, sorry for being late. I appreciate having appreciate you coming on. Sure um, I do have a question about about your Sam Bradford article. Um, great article, by the way. Um, kind of <laughs> crazy to kind of see him come back in general. But um, with him back at practice, how do, for you? Like, how does he look? What are you hearing? And like, are there any like real? chances he actually might get activated before next week's game you know it's i mean from the limited time that we get to see him um in practice you know we didn't even see him throw a pass on wednesday um he did look good moving across the field i had a video up like of him like you know just going you know sideline to sideline passing back and forth with teddy bridgewater and you know the mobility he he looked Honestly, this looked exactly like it did right before the Bears game where, you know, yeah, he looks mobile. He looks like the knee is better. So we honestly, anybody who says they can diagnose how he's going to play in a game or how he could fare under game-like conditions, um, unless they're seeing the practice film where they're going at game speed or, you know, simulating game speed, they have no idea because a lot of that reminded me. Um, you know, ahead of week five when it was okay, is he going to play? Is he going to play? And then we find out that Sunday night um, that he will be the starter. You know, a lot of that is what I saw when I was watching him in practice this week. So that that could be a sign that he's healthy and that the knee feels better. He says it feels, you know, the best it's felt. Um, Surgery was the last resort option. And um, I'm really glad, you know, for his sake, you know, if he wants to keep playing in the NFL, that he had it done because you feel for the guy who's test, you know, tested and tried everything. I mean, he, you know, multiple trips to, to see Dr. James Andrews, you know, he was not going to give up spending money out of his own pocket to go get all of these procedures and, you know, all this stuff done that um, it's clear that he's trying to make a comeback of some sort, whether it's with the Vikings or whether he ends up with another team next year, I think is the real question. As far as, you know, could he be a legitimate, you know, legitimate backup to, to Case Keenum in, in the playoffs, you know, the way I see it now is different than the way I've seen it a few weeks ago. And I mean, it's not just of seeing him in the play, in practice and all that. It makes sense for, you know, this just to be an as needed basis. You know, Teddy is te- going into that divisional round. Teddy is um, case back, cases backup. There's no doubt in my mind that that will happen. If, however, by some, that's why they activated him now because they have that three week window. If 
there was some injury or something else happened that maybe if it was, if they were playing for an NFC championship um, and they needed extra quarterback depth, then they at least would have him available. But I don't think they're thinking right now of, okay, well, you know, we have to get this guy ready for the divisional round. It's just a matter now of, can he, can that knee hold up under game like conditions? Cause nobody wants to see a repeat of what we saw on October 9th. I mean, that was really hard to watch. Um, and it was, you know, you question about how healthy his knee really was that he was out there because he had no mobility whatsoever. You want to see that mobility um, in some form or fashion before you're comfortable throwing him out there. Awesome. Thank you very much. And I think that was the last uh, question. I guess, guys, any other questions for Courtney before we uh, before we let her get out of here? All right. We'll take the silence as, uh, as golden there. I guess my last thing is, Courtney, uh, uh, stop being so nice to to call her on the uh, on the verbal <laughs> podcast. Feel free to rough him up uh, a little bit when he's on there, and uh, and give him a what's up from us the next time you talk to him. Sure thing, I will uh, definitely let him know you guys say hey. Perfect. Well, uh, Courtney, thank you so much for for coming on and uh, and, and lending your insight to us this evening, and uh, you have a great night. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thank thanks, you. Courtney. Well, all right. Well, that was fun, and and ladies and gentlemen. Sure, yeah, you, you picked it up, picked up on it there right, when he asked a question. But the world's best puppy parent has joined the Climbing the Pocket podcast. Mr. Gorham, what's going on, my man? How's it going? It's going all right. How did Teddy got do? Back. Finally got the 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 big little guy to settle down settle down. So well, how good. do you do today? I know I know you had some some you had some issues there for a couple of weeks. I mean, how how how'd it go this week? He did all right. I mean, you could definitely tell there was a couple of weeks off because of the holidays. Um, but he did pretty good. He's he's on his way. He's actually laying right next to me right now, so that that's a good sign. That is a good sign because normally when he's laying right next to you, we hear you saying like "ouch" and him biting you and stuff like that. So you know, <laughs> th- th- well, this <laughs> is progress. <laughs> yeah. We'll hey, take that. He's seven months old and he's sixty-seven pounds right now, so he's a big boy. Wow, wow, yeah, you missed it. Yo, Jr. has snow, yo. What? Yeah. Why is he in the pod? Why is he not like in a shell, a bunker right now? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't know. I don't know. What do you do in this situation? I know, like my grandma used to call me when it get cold like that in North Carolina. She would. She wouldn't even leave the house. She would stock up for the. For a month, make sure she was good to go. Never had to leave the house. I mean, Jr. I think he's just pretty much sitting and got his shopping done last week, and is uh, <laughs> waiting for it to go that, away. That inch of snow is a killer. <laughs> they got six inches, yo. Got six inches, man. Six inches. Oh my bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Well, gentlemen, I feel like we covered everything we wanted to. Here's Miles, question for you. Yo. If the Vikings do make it to the Super Bowl, will you be going to a party to watch with a lot of people, no, or will you be watching? No, nope, I'm not going nowhere. <laughs> okay, All right. I figured that'd be the answer, but I wanted to ask you all the same. <laughs> I've been thinking about it, though. The only other only other thing I would consider is going to my dad's house and watching with my dad, just because you know of how long he's been a fan and watch all the heartbreak and my brother and everything like that. So that'd be the only other thing I'd do. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Well, uh. I'm uh, I'm I'm pretty much tapped on topics here. I guess Jr. Uh, will go down the line, starting with you. I guess anything uh, upcoming that we should be on the lookout for? Nah, nothing this week. I'm um, just focusing on the playoff push, and I'm interested to see who the Vikings will be playing next week. Yes, sir. Miles. Yo. I know you're working on some stuff, man. Uh, can, can we talk <laughs> about it yet, or, or or should we wait till the next one? Um. Wait till the next one, just for the fact that like I have some stuff on the works. I'm just not 100 percent sure what direction I'm going with it yet. Okay, all right. Well, we'll come back. We'll just that's a little teaser for y'all. Next episode, might as well have some stuff to talk to y'all about. And Saxy Prince. Yeah, man. Since you know your man Arif went out there and you know took the he heat away from me. you, he, he fought on your behalf. Um, yeah. what pleasant Vikings positive puff piece will you be writing to get us ready for this playoff push? Oh, um, so I uh, clearly don't like myself, so I'm writing another Case Keenum um, art- article and whatnot. Uh, now that the season's over, I, I, I've mentioned it before, but I'm kind of going through where Case Keenum has succeeded this year uh, and where he has not. So I'll have to you know, kind of go through each and every game to see the areas of the field that he's, he's 
you know, maybe Sher- Shermer has really helped him out um, um, directing more of, you know, his play call towards that area. So that's what I'll be doing. Well, this should be fun. Looking forward to that. That'll, that'll be good times. Good yeah. times, good times. Well, uh, well, gentlemen, you know, thank you for joining. Miles, you know, thank you for, for pushing through puppy parenting and, and coming through to, to get in here and get in on the action, asking some questions and, uh, and letting us know about your Super Bowl plans. But uh, yeah, that's all we got for you guys today. My name is Jason Brown. This has been the Climbing the Pocket Podcast, and we will talk to you soon. Enjoy your bye week. <laughs>